Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to our Spring Botany Talk. Um, we're lucky to be joined by Dr Mark Spencer who will be leading our talk this evening. This forms part of the Holland Park Ecology Centre's initiative around the Bee Superhighway, which is to encourage more pollination hotspots in the Royal Borough for pollinators like butterflies and bees to enjoy and encourage and reproduce. Without further ado, I'll pass over to Mark. Mark will be talking for about 45 minutes, but feel free to put any questions in the chat, which I'll pose to Mark at the end. And if you need captions, and there's an option on the screen for you to have closed captions come up, and a recording of this talk will be made available afterwards <coughs> on our website. Um, so Mark, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm looking forward to your talk this evening. Ah, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me once more. So um, this talk is going to be about spring, um, a little bit of pollinators and lots of pretty pictures. Hopefully give us a bit of a presage of uh, warmer weather to come because it still feels somewhat nippy out there, it's fair to say. And uh, we certainly could do with a decent amount of rain. My allotment in the Isle of Wight is bone dry at the moment. So I'm um, just going to plunge in, frankly, into a bit of a smorgasbord of pretty pictures. So first off, probably the ultimate quintessential image of spring, um, our bluebells, um, without a doubt, one of the great natural heritage wonders of Northwest Europe and particularly Britain and Ireland. We have a very, very large proportion of the world population of these plants. And we also have this pretty much unique assemblage in the way they grow. There are not many other parts of Europe where they form such dominant stands in woodlands such as this. So this is quintessentially in very many ways um, England and is also well known in many parts of London. Such woods as Ricelip Woods or Lesnes Abbey Wood in South East London still have large and healthy populations of native bluebells. And no doubt many of you have heard um, discussion about bluebells and are some bluebells better than others? Are Spanish bluebells bad and are they causing a problem? Um, and there's been quite a lot of science done over the last 15 years or so over this question. I was actually involved um, in my previous career working for the Natural History Museum in setting up um, one of the first citizen science projects in this country where we were looking at bluebells and whether they were at risk. So there's been questions in the past and we're getting to a point now where we're getting to have a bit of a better understanding about what's happening. Um, and it's fair to say, yes, there are non-native bluebells in Britain and a very large amount of them in London. And most urban woods and gardens are a mixture of hybrid bluebells, this so-called Spanish bluebell, um, Hyacinthoides massartiana, with this, a splodge or two of the native non-scripta. Um, but one of the interesting things about the research of late was that this concern that scientists had that the Spanish bluebell was out going to outcompete and hybridise with the native populations seems to be actually not ultimately a significant concern because it would appear that the hybrids such as this plant here, this was actually in Chelsea Physic Garden, this Spanish bluebell, appear to have certain aspects of their biology. They're less competitive, um, not in their physical growth and robustness because they tend to be very lively plants, um, but broadly speaking, they are less fertile. So it would appear that the breeding seems to go from the native bluebell into the hybrid populations and less the other way. So concerns about um, um, Spanish bluebells are um, in the scientific community quietly diminishing. Um, when you look at all the other risks, our natural environment faces probably um, not one of the red alert moments for us. Um, so just a quick chat with you. Not all bluebells are blue. This pink bluebell is a bluebell and we have white bluebells in our native species non scripta. The Spanish bluebell can also come in blue, white and pink. And broadly speaking, the characters to which you look for when you're trying to identify the two different types is the native plant tends to have this sort of gothic arch form. The, whole, the hybrids, the Spanish ones tend to be more upright. The native bluebells have this long, narrow bell shape with strongly curled back petals. 
and the hybrids are more broadly bell shaped with less strongly flexed back petals as well. And there are some other technical features like the pollen color in the hybrids just here. These this is the male part of the anthers. The pollen tends to be a bluish color in the hybrid plants. So there are differences and there are uh, the concerns about the risk are diminishing. Nevertheless, it's fair to say if you are weeding out and cleaning out your garden of excess Spanish bluebell because they can be quite lively in the garden, please don't feel the urge to uh, drop them over the garden fence or etc because you know when you are throwing garden waste out into the landscape you are essentially littering compost it or take it to a council deposit site we don't want the further bluebells in our landscape like this and another little last technical tip for you if you look up here on this pink one can you see these two blue sort of blue excuse me little sort of pale green sprats these are little leaf like structures all bluebells, hyacinthoides, have two of those you can see at each joint. There's one there and one there. There's two of them for each individual flower. The related scylla, the squills, will only have one. So if you're not sure whether you've got a bluebell or a related plant, have a look. Two means hyacinthoides. Right, let us proceed. Um, and I'm going to arrange this all, and this talk also in a bit of a sort of classificatory system. So I started off with the bluebells and I'm remaining within the monocots, um, which is grasses, lilies, orchids, uh, palm trees, and they like those plants with long linear foliage and uh, one seed leaf, and talk a little bit about lords and ladies, the Aeraceae. Now the Aeraceae is almost entirely um, a tropical family. There are a few Mediterranean species, relatively speaking, and in Britain and Ireland we only have two native Arum species, the widespread Arum maculatum, lords and ladies, and I've just noticed a naughty um, and typo just there, um, and then we do have one or two non-native species from the family lurking out and about. Um, this is Lysichiton americanum here on the left. This is the skunk cabbage. Now, um, skunk cabbage is one of the species which has recently been prescribed. It is now considered to be quite severely invasive and it can cause really, really serious damage in um, water systems and streams and damp boggy areas in lowland Britain. So if you do see this plant out in the wild, please report it to the local wildlife trust or to a local biological records centre or a friendly neighbourhood botanist so we can pass the information on because this is a species that we do urgently need to try and get con under control because it is actually starting to cause quite severe damage. Now, one of the things about the air race as a whole is they have this extraordinary structure, this big, large sort of hood shaped thing, the spathe, um, which protects the male and female flowers which are embedded down here in the arum or you can see them sticking up here in the lysichiton, the skunk cabbage. Now, one of the extraordinary attributes of some members of this family is that they are able to regulate their own temperature. So skunk cabbage and a couple of its other relatives in North America, as they emerge in spring, in very early spring, they're often under snow. And what they do is they can elevate their temperature of the cells in the outside of this case, and it melts the snow and they can push themselves out through the snow and regulate their own environment internally to protect the developing ovaries and seeds and, and the, that are developing in the flower spike. So this is Lysichiton americanum, um, invasive species and our important and widespread Aerum maculatum, lords and ladies, known in autumn as cuckoo pipe, when you get those spikes of red seeds that you see in our woodlands and hedgerows. And this is still quite a common plant in the London area. Now I'm going to have a little sip of water because I'm rather dry. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit, staying within the monocots in the Amaryllidaceae. These are members of the plants that are related to the horticultural plant, the Amaryllis, and it includes alliums, the onions and such like this. And one way you can tell this group of plants is that they are monocots, so they have their linear leaves. 
they also have their flowers, as you can see just here, coming from a single universal point in an umbel. And that's quite a distinctive feature for many members of this family. So you can often tell whether it is an amaryllid, as it is the case with these allium plants, by the fact that they have this form. And again, I'm going to stick with the theme of invasiveness because here we have two um, increasingly widespread plants in the London area and also in southwest Britain, which are starting to show some quite unfortunate impacts. Allium triquetrum, this one here on the right in particular, is very, very problematic because this is a non-native plant. It was introduced in the 19th century from the Iberian Peninsula. And as was the case with many plants that originate from the Mediterranean that are low growing, living on the edge of woods such as that, they tend to come into growth in the autumn and winter and put all of their foliage out in the autumn rains and the cool weather of the winter season. This gives them an adaptive advantage over other plants in the environment and ensures that they get lots of sunlight energy when it's not too hot and dry. They can flower and fruit and as the temperature rises, they can then wither and go back under the ground and remain until the following season in their in their onion bulbs. So this advantage that they have in, in, in the Iberian, in Spain and Portugal becomes very, very serious in Northwest Europe because that ecology really, really helps this plant even more because this plant, particularly in places like Cornwall and Devon, Southwest, Dorset, where it's becoming very, very widespread in some areas quite serious, means that this plant's foliage comes up all the way through the winter and it physically outcompetes other woodland and hedgerow plants. So in some areas, it's having quite significant negative impacts upon other woodland plants, such as bluebells, because it squashes them pretty much, really. So this is Allium triquetrum. And it has a less well-known relative um, that is quietly coming up behind on the rear, so to speak, and is becoming more frequent. It has a similar umbellate flower spike. It doesn't have as many flowers. You can see there's only about three or four here, but it has this rather snazzy character of instead of just reproducing by seed from this flower with the triquetrum, it produces little bulbils at the base of this junction where the flowers come from. So this plant has got it both ways. It can reproduce sexually by seed, but also vegetatively by these little bulbils. And Allium paradoxum is not as common in the London area, but it is gradually increasing. So these are two plants which I most definitely would implore you not to throw out over your garden wall or into, um, into a nearby park and be very, very careful about your manage the management of it if you have it growing in your garden. Um, particularly Allium triquetrum here on the right, it can also be used as a handy substitute for wild garlic. And actually it's become so abundant in parts of some parts of London that people think of it as wild garlic now. This is the real thing, Ramsons Allium ursium, and this is a native British plant. And it is a it's a plant that's got a mixed reputation in this country because the uh, the gastronomes, people who like foraging and people like adventurous cooking are very keen of this because of its rich, flavoursome, garlicky taste. Um, whereas in the case, some gardeners are not very keen of it because it is a very dominant and exuberant and robust plant that can cover quite large areas, if not held back to a certain extent. Um, so horticulturists not keen on it. In fact, I was actually having a chat with a gardener about this recently and people, we are all shockers for this. We all tend to see things from our own particular ambit of what we think is important. And so a horticulturalist doesn't like this because it's invasive in their perspective. But from a wildlife and natural history perspective, this plant is superb because it is ecologically naturally dominant, particularly in damper wet woodlands in lowland parts of Britain, but it is also an incredibly important nectar source for a wide range of invertebrates. And one of the things about um, flowers is once you get used to them and you understand their shape and form and colour, you can start to understand what kind of insects are likely to use it. So in the case of something like this, which is a bit 
a bit pongy, has wide open white flowers. It's generally what we refer to as a generalist. It will be able to actually um, be pollinated from a wide range of insects, but particularly flies and beetles, those little things we tend not to care or love about, as well as hoverflies in particular and, and bees. So this is a generalist pollinator and is nevertheless a very important one or po pollinated plant, apology, not pollinator. Now the last, I think, member of the Amaryllidaceae I'm going to talk about, and this often surprises people, is our wild daffodil. And people often like, but it's only got one flower and, you know, and it's not coming off from a, a junction with lots of, that's because some Narcissus do in fact actually have these little junctions with three or four feet flowers on it, but our native Narcissus, pseudo Narcissus, has only one. Nevertheless, structurally, it is quite like Allium in that form, apart from having this rather large, wonderful corolla, the trumpety bit of the daffodil that we love so much. Now, um, while daffodil is definitely a plant which is quite severely diminished in numbers in southeast England, um, it is much, much less common than it used to be, say, 100 years ago. And in the London area, there are very, very few places where you can reliably see a good, healthy population of wild daffodils. And these were actually photographed in Lesnes Abbey Wood in the far southeast of London. Well worth a visit as one of the finer woodlands in the greater London area. So um, it, whilst it is not endangered, it is certainly less common than it used to be. Um, and another thing I would beseech you all, we all like to beautify the space we're in and save some of you who may have um, a country cottage or something like that or have some space in the countryside. Please resist the urge to be planting horticultural daffodils into the landscape because whilst we don't have any clear evidence that these horticultural daffodils could hybridise and cause problems with this, the precautionary principle is such that we would think it's best to avoid such things. And we should be doing our best to encourage and promote the health of our surviving wild daffodil populations. Now, I'm just jumping family into the Iridaceae and I'm going to be zigzagging a bit backwards and forwards through time a bit. So irises are pretty much on the border of being spring and early summer flowers in many respects. Um, but I wanted to include them because they're gorgeous um, and B because they're in themselves very, very interesting. We have two widespread native irises in this country. We have the stinking iris, Iris foetidissima this purpley job in the middle and the yellow flag iris as well. The flag iris is a slightly later flowering plant, arguably it's essentially is early summer, a plant of wetlands, riversides, canals and such like. And the, the um, stinking iris is a plant largely of ancient woodlands and ancient hedgerows. But its unusual attributes for an iris of producing red berries that persist through the winter um, have made it much desired in horticulture and particularly over the last 20 years for mass municipal plantings, car park plantings and your local Tesco. And so this plant is now planted in all sorts of places where it wasn't originally found. And we are starting to find some rather unusual snazzy forms turn up. So this creamy yellow one is sometimes given the name Var Citrina, and you can very often find this growing in London area. And if you do find this one, it will almost certainly be from a garden scape. It's a non-native form of this wonderful native species. So we skip forward through the orchid and um, the sort of, excuse me, the monocots. <coughs> I come to the orchid family. Now, for much of Britain and Ireland, orchids really are a sort of early to high summer group of plants, but we have several species in Britain and southeast which are early plants. We have the early purple orchid here on the left hand side, and then we have the early marsh orchid, Dactylorhiza incarnata in the middle, and then the green winged orchid on the far right. Now, each one of these orchids has its own 
particular habitat preferences and foibles. Now, one of the things is fair to say is that tragically, certainly in Greater London, all of these plants are either um, on the brink of extinction or very, very uncommon indeed. So in the case of early purple orchid, um, I believe I've not got a reliable record for North London for about a decade. So this is plant which still occurs locally in southern, southern London in the woods around Croydon, for example, but it is becoming increasingly uncommon because of damage to its habitat, poor woodland management, and also increasingly the massive increasing abundance in deer because deer do like a good orchid to nibble. So as soon as the flower spikes come up, whoop, they're off. So we have the early purple orchid, which is known to um, Shakespeare and his likes as dead men's fingers or long purples, which is a name that caught my attention, dead men's fingers when I was a child, which is kind of ironic considering my career now working in forensic botany. And dead men fingers was given its name because of the fact that the roots are bloated and swollen and were believed to sort of reference and look like the bloated fingers of a dead man's hand sticking through the ground. Charming. Now, the early marsh orchid is a much, much rarer plant nationally and is restricted to um, kind of fen habitats and is very, very uncommon over much of Britain. I mainly put this particular image in because I love these plants. This was actually photographed in West Cornwall, an area which is very close to my heart. And the third orchid I'm going to talk about momentarily here is the green winged orchid. Now, the green winged orchid has very recently been actually categorised as vulnerable to extinction in this country, despite the fact there are still some locations where you can see tens, if not hundreds of thousands of specimens. The overall population decline and loss of individual sites for this particular plant has been enormous over the last 50 years. Um, it is a plant of open grassland, sort of ancient meadows, flung plain meadows, unlike the ancient woodlands of the early purple orchid. And this is a habitat which is incredibly endangered. We hear a lot of, of in our society about concern about woodlands and about planting trees for conservation and climate change reasons. We forget as a society that grasslands are immensely important for sequestering carbon, for ecological diversity and for their own beauty and value in their own right. So I implore you to support grasslands wherever you can because we desperately, desperately need to save what's left of them. And uh, wild orchids, in the case of green winged orchid, we are now in a situation where the wild grassland populations of this plant in London are gone. The last surviving colony was in a cemetery in South London, but it vanished for about a decade and now it has reappeared on green roofs of all places. I think we now have about three locations in London where it is living on a green roof. Each location has only got a tiny colony of three or four plants. So this now is now an extremely rare plant in the Greater London area. Now, one of my great favourite and rather more demure beauties of ancient woodlands in Britain is the herb Paris, Paris quadrifolia. And this is a delightful and extraordinary plant with these rather subtle green flowers in parts of four, which is quite unusual because this is a monocot and most monocots are in sets of three. Um, Paris is rather odd for that, but it is a very close relative of plant called Trillium, the wake robins of North America, which have its parts in three. Paris quadrifolia is an excellent ancient wood indicator. So if you find this plant in a piece of woodland, you will often find it along with bluebells and lots of other really, really nice plants. You know you've got a piece of woodland that is going to be hundreds and hundreds of years old because this is a plant that is very, very slow moving. And we hear a lot about mitigation and replanting woodlands when you have developments or motorways or railways building. Never, ever, ever will you see people talking about or considering planting or replanting or re-establishing populations of Paris quadrifolia or its relatives. You cannot replace a woodland with some saplings. And another great, wonderful favourite of mine of Britain, which annoyingly I have never seen in flower in this country, 
is the yellow star of Bethlehem, Gagea lutea. This is a scattered plant across Britain. It's never super abundant. You get little colonies in certain ancient woodlands. Um, and I've always missed it in flower, or I've got this particular plant was photographed in a massive colony of tens of thousands in central Norway when I was there a few years ago. Again, Gagea lutea is a wonderful indicator of ancient woodland habitat. And these indicators, we give the special term axiophytes. So we've left the uh, monocots and we've moved into the dicots. And we're going to talk about poppies, or rather their relatives, and two um, delightful members of the poppy family. The one on the right, Chelidonium magus, the greater celandine, is quite well known to most people, quite well known amongst other things for the fact if you break the stems or the leaves or flower, it bleeds a bright orange latex, which is quite startling and fascinating. On the left is a plant which many people would be somewhat gobsmacked to discover is related to poppies, um, is fumaria or the fumatries, or in this particular case, Western ramping fumatry. And I put this plant in because it's it's in my probably top 10 favourite British plants. Um, and it is very much a spring flowering plant because fumarias are essentially Mediterranean species and the British wild populations of Fumaria, the northern edge of their European range. And Fumarias are annual plants. And a bit like Bluebell, they have this strategy of, um, under the three-cornered leek rather, of germinating in the autumn rains, growing quite rapidly. And as soon as the sunlight levels start to increase in early spring, they come into flower. So this is Western ramping fumatory, which can be, and several of the other fumatories you can see in flower from about March, April onwards in many places such as roadside verges, field margins or old hedges. This particular plant is the most glamorous and largest of the British um, ramping fumatories and has a total global range of more or less just the whole of West Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. This is an internationally rare plant that is really something quite special for these islands. And the other celandine, because sometimes people get confused between the celandines, is not a poppy. It's a buttercup, but it's not a buttercup because it is no longer in the genus Ranunculus. So as evil botanists have taken Ranunculus ficaria and we have moved it into its own special little genus ficaria. So this is now ficaria verna. There are actually about four or five different subspecies of ficaria grow verna growing in southern Britain, two of which are widespread and others are rather odd garden escapes. In many cases, they can indicate ancient woodland habitat, but they're also rather rough and tufty and get all over the landscape. But these plants are some of our earliest flowering wild plants are incredibly important for pollinators, as well as cheering up our lives, because these things are frankly incredibly beautiful. But the fact that they're common means we tend to ignore them. We're shockers for thinking we only get excited by rarity. It's time to get excited by common things. In the buttercup group, we're going to stick with another ancient woodland indicator group, and this is Ranunculus oricomus, the Goldilocks. And these are a curious and complicated group of buttercups. Um, and the great complexity about them is the fact that there are several hundred species of Goldilocks in Britain. Um, and they are very, very challenging to identify and really, really quite terrifying, even for a botanist such as myself. This population here on the right is actually from Harefield Church, just near Harefield Church in the far northwest of London in the borough of Hillingdon. Uh, and this population is quite unusual because most of the many, several hundred species of Goldilocks that we know of in this country have rather small almost malformed flowers like this individual on the left. The ones in Harefield are rather glamorous by comparison with its other Goldilocks relatives. And then last of the sort of brassy bright 
spring trio of yellows in the ranunculus and ranunculaceae is Caltha palustris. And this is again another plant which on one level we think of as being common, but actually in most lowland southeast Britain, many of its wild populations have been wiped out by agricultural improvement, urbanisation, tidying up of railways, sides and streams, etc. And many of the wild populations are now gone. And certainly in the London area, quite a few of the populations that are now here are a slightly larger garden escape that was introduced from elsewhere. But nevertheless, these feral butter and marsh marigolds in the London area are important and delightful. Then, of course, the wooden enemy. Um, I personally think this might be my favourite ancient woodland indicator plant because um, it's just, well, it's just incredibly beautiful. Um, people tend to get slightly less excited about it compared it to bluebells. But one of the things in its grace and favour from a botany perspective is the fact that it is a much better indicator of ancient landscape than bluebells. Bluebells are actually the native plant quite mobile. They can move into new territory, relatively speaking, quite quickly. Whereas nud, nud wood anemone and Paris as well are slow growing plants that move very, very slowly. So if you find a woodland or a hedgerow with this plant growing it in the wild, you know you're in a species rich, diverse, important old piece of landscape. Now, leaving the buttercup family behind, I'm going to have a little chat about several groups of plants we tend to forget about, first of which is the currants. So red currant, black currant, gooseberry, the genus Ribes, we tend to think of as being of value to the wildlife from a fruit perspective. But actually, they are very, very important in spring for the nectar source. So this is red currant growing in an ancient woodland up in Hillingdon again. And this plant was oozing nectar. So these plants are a very important nectar source for um, early, um, early moving insects and various types of bee. Then we have meadow saxifrage. Now, this is another plant that has suffered a huge decline in the Greater London area. I know of only about two or three sites left. This is actually on Kew Green, where it hangs on by the skin of its teeth right next to the cricket pitch under some trees. Um, this is a species which is definitely on its knife edge in the Greater London area. And then next to it, unfortunately not in flower, the diminutive rue-leaved saxifrage. And this is one of the most extraordinary plants in London because 20 years ago, this species was on the brink of extinction in Greater London. I could have probably gone to the last two or three remaining sites that I knew of and counted no more than 20 plants in any given year. And then about 15 years ago, it just started popping up almost like mushrooms all over London, particularly near the railway stations on the south side of the river, so Waterloo, etc., around that and the approaches to Victoria. But it is now moving out into streets. It's been one of the most extraordinary recoveries of a wild plant that I've ever seen, frankly. It is really, really quite incredible how this species is now moving out to become a common street plant. And then for a bit more colour once more, two plants that um, are kind of again rather indicate remnants of old landscape and London past in many ways. Gorse, where it is still found, is usually hanging on in former heathland sites such as Hampstead or on railway sides that have been cut through older landscape and is obviously one of the great heralds of spring in many ways. Despite the reputation of being, you know, flowering all through the year, gorse certainly has its peak in spring. And then the much more sedate bush fetch, Vicia sepium, with these classic pea flowers and these blue tones. These are plants which are incredibly important to bees, for example. Right. I'm going to then just show you a little bit of horticultural, or excuse me, botanical curiosity from areas outside of Greater London, two very um, fantastic plants I'm very fond of. The one on the right is starry clover. This is Trifolium stellatum. This delightful member of the clover family only grows wild in two places in southern Britain. And it is another one of these Mediterranean wintergreen annuals that germinates in the cool damp, grows like the clappers, 
flowers and then burns out in the summer heat. And then next to it, the delightfully named Bithnian pea with these extraordinary flowers and really, really rather marvellous stipules. Just here, these specialised structures here. Two very, very beautiful early season plants of southern Britain and both very uncommon. If you see them, please let me know. Um, and then just to remind you, you know, we tend to think as human beings of what can we do for pollinators? What's important for pollinators? And we uh, respond with our own visual receptors. We tend to think, OK, we plant something that is good for, it, for our site. It's going to be good for bees. Don't think that way. Look at what's feeding on wild plants and you will learn that actually Wild insects don't necessarily go for big and blousy poppies and cornflower seed mixes. What you need to do is get to understand them. So, for example, in very early spring, the various willow species, species such as this goat willow and to a certain extent, even catkin plants such as Alnus glutinosa are important sources of nectar and pollen for quite a wide range of invertebrates. Two really, really important sort of members of our ancient woodland, which are often confused by people, are two of our violet species. Um, and they are the early dog violet on the left hand side here and the common dog violet here on the right hand side. And these two species are often confused by beginner botanists. And if you are a social media person and you're on Twitter, I strongly recommend you follow Wildflower Hour because that's a wonderful way of improving your botany and connecting with people who can help you out, including the marvellous Moira from South London, who has done a huge amount to help beginners over the last few years and particularly through COVID. Now, early dog violet, it tends to be a species which is much, much more associated with ancient woodland landscape. It doesn't tend to get out into new habitats very often and it is never planted. It tends to flower a little bit earlier than the other dog violet and you'll see that the petals, this is one of the characters you have to look for, there are several because they do hybridise which doesn't make life easy. The petals tend to be very upright like that, like little bunny ear or hair ears. Whereas the common dog violet, you can see the petals are much broader and rather more splayed out and back to a certain extent. They are um, sometimes quite tricky to tell apart. These two images I've selected are nice, easy individuals. Why are they called dog violets? Because they don't have a scent. A plant that has dog attached to it, generally in sort of English language, tends to refer to something that's, you know, not quite the mark, not quite the cut, not the, the preferred or the best form. So in plants with that kind of appellation are usually, in this case, unscented, unlike the sweet violet, Viola odorata. Now, one thing that often throws people is they pick a violet and think, oh, I'll identify it by the scent and you smell it and there's no scent. And that will probably be, if you have got a sweet violet, because it is too cold. Sweet violet scent is very temperature selective. So if you're not sure, take your violet and keep it warm and then give it a bit of a sniff and you will probably get a bit of smell out of it or put it in a little pot and take it home. So sweet violets can generally be told by their scent, unlike the other two species, which are scentless. They also tend to be quite hairy in comparison to the other two species. And there are other technical characters which I won't go into at this point. Now, sweet violets are quite widespread in woodlands and garden over much of Greater London, but actually in much of London, they're actually not native plants because sweet violet as a wild native plant in Britain is largely restricted to chalk and limestone areas. So in the London area, that would be south of the River Thames, down Croydon Way, etc. for example, much of North London, it is not a native plant. It's been introduced through several hundred years of horticulture and has escaped and move around to become very well naturalised. And there is this pretty common white form called var imberbis, which we see quite often in some areas. Another classic of ancient woodlands, um, much beloved by my mother when she was a child. She used to 
still talks about uh, nibbling the young fresh leaves of these with their nice acidic zing uh, as she was walking home from school. The wood sorrel Oxalis acetazella, again like um, the wood anemone, does not move around in landscape very rapidly. It's a slow colonizer. So again, you know you've got old environment when you find this plant growing wild. Um, it is the only wild British native species. As I suspect some of you who are gardeners would know, our gardens and parks are full of quite a wide range of non-native oxalis species, but this is the only one that you will find out in an ancient woodland. And now we have two strawberries. Well, one's the real strawberry and the other is the barren strawberry. Now, both of these plants are again no longer sadly common over much of Greater London, a bit more so in the south, less in so in the north of London. And in fact, actually, Fregaria vesca, the true wild strawberry here on the left, is actually declining sufficiently that it is potentially considered to be at risk of extinction, would you believe it, in England. Its population has declined so much over the last few decades. And it's Closish relative, Potentilla sterilis, the barren strawberry. Barren because, not surprisingly, it does not produce juicy fruits. Now, these two plants often confuse people. People are like, have I got the real thing? Have I got a real strawberry or a barren strawberry? And you don't obviously know until you've got a, um, a fruit in many cases. Broadly speaking, for a little bit of practice, True wild strawberry has a larger flower. Obviously, it's hard if you have not got two in front of you. Relatively speaking, these are probably only about two thirds the size or half the size of a true wild strawberry. You'll notice how the petals in wild strawberry are, apart from just here, more or less entirely or just touch, touching and overlapping. In barren strawberry, they're separated by quite a wide gap. And the tips on these petals go round like this, whereas the tips of barren strawberry go in, almost like a heart shaped form at the end. And the foliage, once you get used to, also has some character differences. So that's the difference between the two wild strawberries that often confuse people. And on to the next one, excuse me. Right. Um, now I'm going to move on to the cabbage. Excuse me, the phone just made a, a ping. Um, and we have two important members of the cabbage family, particularly, oh, I've just noted there's a typo there as well, very naughty me, is that we have hedge garlic, Alaria petiolata, and cuckoo flower, cardamine pretensis. These are plants that are important for ecologically for the orange tip butterfly because the butterfly lays their caterpillars on these flowers to feed their caterpillars. So it lays their eggs rather on there for the caterpillars. These are two plants with somewhat different habitat preferences. Elaria is a woodland, hedgerow, sometimes waste and sort of edges of garden type of plant, whereas cuckoo flower is more a plant of wet meadows, pastures and bogs. Um, it's sad to say that cuckoo flower again is another plant which in much of lowland Britain is much, much less common than it used to be 50 years ago. Alaria is a much beloved plant, again, by foragers in this country and by natural historians. But if you go to North America, this is one of the most reviled invasive plants in North America because this species was actually introduced into the extraordinarily diverse woodlands of northeast United States and is causing devastation because it's out competing native plant communities in these in these forests. And a, another little member of the cabbage family, and we're in the cabbage family, is Danish scurvy grass. Now, this 30 years ago, I wouldn't have included in a slide of sort of London plants, so to speak. But this has now moved from its coastal environment because the genus Cochlearia are essentially coastal plants. They like salty environments, marshlands, sea cliffs, etc. But this plant has moved inland through road salting. So this has now become locally a very common spring wildflower on London's trunk road. So if you go down the A40, probably round about now, it'll look a bit like it's been sleeting or there's been snow scattered all across the central reservation. That white is caused by Danish scurvy grass and it will have mixed in with it or certainly the less salty areas little plants which will flower just before it, Erophila verna. 
uh, and this is a quite delightful one of the earliest flowering spleen plants of Britain, often overlooked because a sort of titan in the in its group will probably be, oh, you know, two or three inches. They're often usually only about an inch high. These are tiny, tiny plants. And st sticking with small and I'm moving away from London, I just wanted to put this in because this is again probably one of my favourite British wild plants. This is the spring sandwort uh, and this is a member of the carnation family. These flowers are quite small in real life, about the size of my fingernail. Uh, and this is a delightful and quite rare plant you find on um, rather unusual rock um, formations in certain parts of western northern Britain. This was actually photographed in early spring on my favourite botanical stomping ground, the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall. And it has close relatives associated with ancient woodlands and hedgerows of southern Britain, the delightful and beautiful Greater Stitchwort. And this is one of these plants which I still cannot quite get my head around why has not been taken into the, the horticultural canon because this is an incredibly beautiful plant. It is ecologically really important um, and enriches so many pieces of surviving ancient landscape, both in the London area where it's still found here and there, but certainly further afield in lowland Britain. And sticking with that idea of aesthetics, people tend to, as I said earlier on, focus on the big and the bold and the beautiful, the things that trigger our emotions. But nature doesn't work that way. Nature is about functionality. And if you want a plant with functionality, plant Alexander's. This is an ancient non-native introduction brought in by the Romans as a pot herb. It's a Mediterranean plant um, and Alexander's comes into leaf again incredibly early in the warm parts of South Britain um, and flowering it's already quite heavily well into flower now and it will be dripping with nectar and will have some pollen and is a really important source of food for flies there's another little dip to a thing there I'm no good at these things I don't do things with legs and wings um, but this is an incredibly important plant for invertebrates in early spring and oh and then a sort of little trio of some sort of wonderful members of the mint family. I also forgot just a moment ago, I forgot to put any primulas in, which is very naughty of me. Here we have three members of the mint family, each of which sort of tells another wonderful tale in its own right. Ground ivy on the left, if you see this plant growing in great abundance in grass, it tends to be quite low. You can usually tell you that you've got lots of rabbits in the area because rabbits find this plant particularly loathsome and they will not eat it. But this blue tubular form is brilliant for bees, for example, for pollination. In the middle, it's relative Galeopsis, the yellow, yellow archangel. This is the native form, not the non-native invasive one that has silvery splotches on the leaves. Again, please do not let that silvery sploshed one get out into the wider countryside. This is a superb indicator for old landscape. If you see this growing in an old wood with bluebells, Paris, Stitchwort, wild strawberries, you have got a really wonderful, rich and important piece of old landscape. And the same even with the delightful buga, a bugle, a juga reptans. If you find this growing in grassland or on the edges of woodlands, it is quite often strongly indicative of old landscape with a lot of wildlife value. And then just to finish off in the daisy family, we don't really have many British plants in the daisy family that are spring blooming, but I thought I would juxtapose with the somewhat notorious winter heliotrope, again from southern Europe, a potentially invasive species, particularly in southwest Britain, where the climate is really to its liking. I have a mixed feelings about this plant because I absolutely adore the scent of it. It is incredible and delightful. And then on the right hand side, the absolutely fantastic and wonderful common lawn daisy Bellis perennis, which I hope you are all going to plant into your lawns this spring and summer to help the pollinators in your area. Thank you. Great, Mark. Um, as always, a fascinating talk and thank you so much for your time and knowledge and expertise. Um, before I crack on with the questions, I'd just like to highlight again that this talk 
is part of our BC Super Highway initiative to encourage more pollinated hotspots across the borough. And I'm sure you see lots of links from what Mark has said about how we can plant flowers to help the pollinators. I always want to highlight that Mark is back, hopefully in person in July to do a summer botany walk in the park for us. And again in November to do our um, very popular fungi foray. And our next virtual talk is on stag beetles on the 22nd of May um, with Laura from the People's Trust for Endangered Species and full details of all the information is on our website. So Mark, are you okay to answer some yes, questions? Yes, sure. Yeah. Cool. So if I just start from the top, um, someone asks, I was told that the British bluebell flower flowers later than the Spanish bluebell. Is that true? Um, it does tend to, again, it will depend on where you are in the country, but you certainly tend to find if you've got the popular, there's a s bit of an overlap. But in areas such as London, where there are a lot of hybrids, the, the boundary slightly overlaps. But yes, overall, it does tend to flower a little bit later. Cool, thank you. Um, is there a limit to how long a plant features in an area um, slash country and is considered non-native? <laughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> right. Um, so native and non-native. Um, it's interesting because we juxtapose the idea of those two words with how we talk about people and society. And then we have the problem of how that those two same words are used very differently in natural history and science. So being native or non-native, first off, you have to just don't think of them as good or bad either way. They're neutral terms. They're statements of fact, presence or absence kind of thing. Mm. Something that is non-native has got into a particular area through the activity of humanity. It's got here. It does not matter how long it's been here. So if something was introduced by humans 3000 years ago, it is still non-native. Um, what we tend to do in botany now for those really long established non-native plants, we call them archaeophytes. So a, a well-known archaeophyte or non-native that people think of as native would be the common mallow. Malva sylvestris is so abundant and well fitted into our environment. We Even I usually think, is it a native or a non-native? It's actually a non-native. It was introduced with early agriculture several thousand years ago. So it's not about how long something has been here, it's how it got here. Cool. Thank you. Um, Becky asks, if three cornered leek and wild garlic are both similar plants and both are invasive, why is the first one a problem and the other isn't? Again, uh, this interesting. It's about language and stuff and what people think is it, their perspectives. So when I was talking about wild garlic, Allium ursinum, ransoms, I use the word invasive in the context of what gardeners think about it. OK, because gardener, you know, people, you, if you've got a, I'm into gardening and I don't like it in my garden. So invasive gardeners use invasiveness in a different way to the way us natural historians and botanists and scientists use it. So in the wild, um, Allium ursinum is a naturally dominant plant in certain parts of a woodland habitat, usually in areas where the ground is too wet for bluebells. So um, is they, the Allium ursinum is not invasive. It's, it's, it's dominant in certain areas, but it's fitting into its niche. Whereas what we are seeing with three cornered leek is um, a massive population expansion, which is physically out competing and pushing other plants, both native and non-native, actually, in some cases, including archaeophytes, pushing them out of their homes, to put it in crude terms. And there's a lot of free corner leak in our, in our woods yeah. in Holland Park. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing is about the invasiveness, because, again, this is a complicated thing. Gardeners tend to use it in one mean way to think, oh, you know, annoying weed in my garden. For scientists, invasiveness can be something that happens with native plants or non-native plants, because there are some native plants which are invasive, and that um, invasiveness is about significant damage or loss or destruction to the habitat or the species within it. Um, so when we use the I word, or certainly when I use it, I really am talking about significant problems 
that are affecting the structure of the ecosystem. Cool, thank you. Um, someone asked, um, what are the best um, late flowering plants, wild plants that we can find in our garden for pollinators late in the season? Ah. Um, please, please, please do avoid these um, rather cod wildflower seed mixes. Um, again, use use your observational skills for a start. I think it's very, very, very important that people start looking and seeing what bees and invertebrates, hoverflies and all these things, what they feed on. Holly, I'm sorry, excuse me, ivy is a fantastic plant for various invertebrates, really important. How many people proactively think, hmm, I'm going to plant some ivy? Um, but if you, I was going to pick, say, a top three or four for late summer, sunny place in southeast England for London, um, hemp agrimony, Eupatorium cannabinum, fleabane, Pulicaria dysenterica, um, knapweed, Centauria nigra, and greater knapweed, Centauria scabiosa. Um, let's think of a number five. I'm trying to think of an oh, and then for a bit of legume joy, I would go with um, Vicia cracker, um, one of the vetches, the big vetch. Can't remember its English name, Wilson. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, there's questions about um, wildflower meadows. Um, any tips for making wildflower meadows? And a question asking about wildflower scattering, if, when it is appropriate, and what alternatives where it is not. Mm -hmm. Right, so the first thing about wildflower meadows, I mean, if you're, is a lot of it will depend upon the size of your garden and the space you're responsible for. So I'm, I'm this question I'm assuming is within the space that's yours. Um, so it may be that if you've got a small space, um, mowing your lawn hard, sowing what's called yellow rackle to reduce fertility and planting plug plants, so small young plants, or things like I've just mentioned, as well as things like clovers and a few other species. So for small spaces, small plug plants, as we call them, are very useful. On the general idea of wildflower seed mix and scattering, um, to a biologist such as me, they are an anathema as things stand. We should not be going out into the countryside or the streets of London or London's parks and thinking that a pretty multicoloured seed packet you've got in your hand and throwing it around is good environmentally. Um, I've had some really quite fierce discussions with people on social media and another scenario about this and I've had come to blows with Chris Packham on this. Um, <laughs> unless you know what you are scattering over, do not do it because again, if you're not a trained botanist and a trained natural historian, you look at what you think is a boring piece of grass and go, oh, there's nothing there, I'll put some seed over it. You, you could be damaging an important population of a rare plant. And the example I make, so for example, is a little bit far off for uh, people in Kensington, Chenser. If you go to Mile End Park in East London, my favourite urban parks, is very, very good overall for plant diversity and invertebrates. There's an area with very short mown grass about that high. That mown grass, which looks drab to most non-botanists, um, is fantastic because it has several of London's rarest and most vulnerable uh, members of the pea family growing in it, including a nationally rare and scarce species. So again, don't think, oh, roadside verge, it's green, therefore I need to be putting some cornflowers in. You need expert guidance and advice. Rant over. Okay, I, I won't mention Buddy today to you either. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next question is, um, how is the abundance or disappearances of plants monitored? Ah, so at the moment um, overall, because it's fair to say, um, successive governments have got worse on um, supporting natural history and nature monitoring in this country. It is increasingly falling into the arms of the amateur natural history community. So when it comes to plants, um, nearly all of the monitoring in this country is done under the aegises and activity of the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, which if you love plants, wild plants, I strongly recommend you join. And there is a national network of people like myself who um, compile records and those records are compiled regionally into what we call vice counties. 
So you um, and me at this current time are in the historic Vice County of Middlesex and I'm the VC recorder. So while plant records for Middlesex come to me, they then go to the National Data Hub and they are used for all sorts of things around UK red listing for rare plants, for putting names plant species forward for going onto the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but also that data is relevant for climate change research, um, planning applications, you name it. The amateur natural history community in this country, not only plants, but birds, butterflies, bees, you name it, fungi, we through our efforts contribute probably if you were to properly work it through contributing to billions of pounds in the UK economy in terms of what we service and enable um, and it is a disgrace nationally that successive governments fail to support and acknowledge it. Thank you. Um, so I'm just, I'm just asked just to um, repeat what rabbits do to ground ivy. Oh is what right ground ivy does. so rabbits can't bear it in general, rabbits don't like the taste of members of the mint family, which includes ground ivy, um, the yellow archangel and the bugle. They avoid it. And um, that's why, you know, sometimes people say, oh, in rabbity area, plant lavender, plant mint, because they'll avoid it. So what happens is ground ivy, if it's growing in an area where there are lots of rabbits, the um, rabbits will eat everything around but the ground ivy. So the ground ivy basically does really, really well. So you can play this little game if you're on a sort of motorway, you know, traveling or you're not on a train. If at this time of year you see a large sheet of blue on a sunny bank, that will almost certainly have a large population of rabbits nearby because they graze everything and leave the ground and the ground ivy behind. Cool, thank you. And then um, I think you kind of answered this, but um, someone's just asking what single plant would you recommend people people plant to benefit pollinators that can be grown in a pot or containers in a, in a small pot. space and that's difficult that's an incredibly difficult one because that pot could be in a hot sunny place a dry shady place a frosty place or a windy place or north you know those kind of variables mm, yeah in general so putting that aside i would recommend if you want something that is aesthetically appealing and is going to attract say bumblebees and other things like that. Um, members of the mint family are generally good goer. So um, rosemary, um, lavenders, um, teucriums um, and their ilk. Any of those aromatic minty things are and, and their hyssop. Those are all those are pretty good, but there's no such thing as an all round plant ultimately because um, of the evolutionary relationship between plants and invertebrates. OK, cool. And then um, I, I, um, Becky, I was just saying that um, she did um, scatter some forget-me-not seeds over some nettles last year. Was that not a good idea? Well, I don't know where the nettles were or where your forget-me-nots were. So um, again, I mean, if it's your own garden, obviously it's your own choice. Um, it's probably fair to say that your forget me me not probably failed to do anything because nettles are very exuberant and again I think it's being thinking very carefully about what you're doing I'm not saying in this particular case that what you've, you've done is bad but your motivations about it and our motivations as human are often driven by our own personal prejudices like I mean, forget me nots are good for a various range of insects, but we oh, blue is pretty, therefore it's good. Nettles are green and dull, they're bad kind of thing. So you have to be very careful. I mean, the, the absolute point is you should not in any circumstances be throwing wildflower seed mixes into landscape that you are not legally responsible for. Um, I personally, frankly, think it's I actually think guerrilla gardening is deeply irresponsible and is bad on many levels. Again, because guerrilla gardeners um, believe it is their right to go into a piece of space which they have not got in many cases. OK, there might be some who do and dig up pieces of turf and plant things. If you don't have any knowledge of what that turf contains, you could be doing significant damage. I'm sorry to be controversial on that. I suspect some of you may be quite keen on guerrilla gardening, but I am not.
No, that's okay. And um, <laughs> as, like I say, if anyone's local to the um, our Holland Park, um, they can contact the college and we can advise as well. And <laughs> we're obviously in close contact with Mark as well. And Mark, I have a slightly odd question that someone told me a while back. You know, in this, how flowers flower, do they do they naturally flower in colour bands, if you see what I mean? Do all the white flowers tend to come out together and then all the yellow flowers and the blue flowers? Is that just a myth? Um, ooh, you will get cohorts of colour, um, but it's probably more simple than just a certain thing because the massive complexity around the, the woodland habitat, the ecosystem and the plant community diversity. But you will find, for example, that certain cohort types of plant will piggyback on the fact that another plant is flowering and they will ultimately have evolved similar colours because then they can maximise um, um, their own pollination. So there's lots of cases, for example, in the Mediterranean of, of orchid species um, mimicking other plants so that they get their pollinators. So in the eastern Mediterranean, some of the rock roses, the cistus, um, a couple of the orchid species there have flowers that mimic the, um, the rock rose flower to get pollination. And um, the very, very rare in this country, red helleborine, almost certainly um, mimics um, Campanula of all things. Um, so we visually see red, red helleborine as a sort of rose, a pink, red, pinky, rosy red, um, and Campanulas are essentially blue, but it's probably likely for various reasons that, um, that this plant is mimicking Campanulas because the orchid um, doesn't have anything to give the insect. It doesn't produce nectar. Um, the Campanulas do and some pollen. So the orchid is cheating. No, no, thank you. Um, that's all our questions, Mark. So um, our thanks again for you to join us this evening. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this again forms part of the B Super Highway. And we look forward to seeing you in person in July and again in November for your popular mm -hmm. Bosnian and Funky Four Way walks. And the full details of all our events and Max is going to do some mindfulness events on our website. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone, this evening. Good evening, everybody. Have a good evening. Cheers, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.